This is Metabolic Radio, the podcast dedicated to keeping you informed when it comes to everything fitness. My name is Taylor Ampey, and with the help of my co-host Shane Pace, we aim to expose the truths about the health and fitness industry. The information and suggestions given in this podcast should not be considered as clinical or medical advice. Consult with a physician before implementing any information provided on this podcast. Away we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time. It's that time. It's daytime for questions and answers. Oh, okay. It's different Q different, and A. Different answer. So, Katie is uh, wondering. She says, "How many carbs should I be consuming in a day? I lift weights and work. Uh, I would like to lose body fat. Uh, I aiming for about seven to eight percent. Wow, I've been total? doing." I've been – yeah, just one sec. I've been doing total body workouts three days a week and intervals two to three times a week. Any suggestions for meals or exercise programs to help me achieve this? Also, do – what are the barbell exercises that you do? And um, I'm looking for other ways to lean down. So I'm considering intermittent – or I've been doing intermittent fast – or I, uh, I've been doing intermittent fasting, but I just switched to five or six meals a day. Um, I would get so, away from that. And she's doing she's doing one twenty four hour day fast though. So she's basically doing she get an effect. Yeah. Okay. So now I guess the question is: you said um, you'd like to lose body fat about seven or eight percent. So I assume you're meaning you want you want to lose seven or eight percent. I hope not that's you want to go down to seven yeah, or eight percent. That's that's not that's that's actually a really high health risk for for females. Yeah. So. Let's say that you did mean that you were going. She was going to go down to um, seven to eight percent total body fat. No, that's too low. Yeah, don't do that. Essential body fat for women is right around thirteen percent. Ten to fifteen. Yep. Uh, you go below thirteen, twelve. It's going to be pretty, pretty sure for certain. But anyway, what ha- what's going to happen? It's going to depend on the person. But what's going to happen is competitors go down around ten. Yeah, that. and they lose they lose their periods. Oh no, they start no, it having metabolic with them. damage. I'm not denying it messes with them. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I'm just saying that they can. It's sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's it's doable at 10. percent It's not. Oh yeah, seven it's to doable. Eight, seven but, to eight's nearing death. But for a female to maintain that lean and not have metabolic issues, that's pretty unlikely. Agreed. So so if your total body fat was going to be seven or eight percent, I, I wouldn't really recommend going down to that. But if you're Looking at losing seven to eight percent, like if you're, uh, you know, in the mid, at the if you're looking to lose seven or eight percent, you you're probably you know maybe in the mid twenties. I'm I'm assuming. I would guess the same. Um, or yeah, so um, it just kind of depends on where you're at. I wouldn't. T- I would not recommend you go below thirteen. It's just not going to be maintainable, and it, you might have some health. health yeah, side not as not result. not as not as a lifestyle level. It's fifteen percent is pretty. Solid. Yeah. So if you were – honestly, if you were to get uh, – for, for, for re- women, let's just talk about ranges. The um, approximate normal range for women is going to be right around the mid, mid-20s. mid mm-hmm. That's normal. Healthy is going to be the, the low 20s and in the, in the 20th percentile. Um, healthy is going to be the high teens and competitive or athletic and essential is going to be in the, in the mid. mid to low teens. Yep. Uh, essential body fat being around, around 12 or 13. Uh, percent. So that kind of gives you an idea of where you're at. Now, um, other parts of your question were how many carbs should I be consuming in a day? Um, and you kind of gave us an idea about your routine. Do you want us to go first with you, your thoughts? No, you can go with carbs. So um, for your routine, I really like your routine. It's what we advocate a lot, which is you know foundational lifting sessions about three times a week um every other day typically alternating so you get some rest in there um and doing some other uh, potentially lower volume stuff in the middle and if you're doing some um, interval training that's fine too um uh i prefer that versus steady state cardio training now so i don't i I wouldn't say she's overtraining yeah but i I would argue the steady state thing it depends on how you use it 
That's true. I mean, low intensity steady state. No, you could walk. I I, I think well, that's walking. What I'm saying. I'm saying that's what I'm saying though. You could use walking and walk for 20 minutes. Well, yeah, that's I out. wouldn't even call that cardio to be honest. That's just activity. Mm. I mean, it's purpose. It's exercise if it's purposeful <laughs> and planned and and everything like that. But um, so anyway, I don't think she's necessarily like overtraining or no, no, not by any like means. To see on this, no, um, not, not not based on the questions. Yeah. Now, as for carbohydrates, um, you know, I, I, I kind of have been talking to a lot of people about this this week about uh, being intuitive eaters. Um, we've talked... Which is fair. Yeah. We've talked about ketogenic dieting and things like that. But um, in my opinion, and I've experimented with this long term, well, yeah, fa- fairly long term, but ketogenic diets are hard to maintain for sure. So, the you know, we talk about the benefits of healthy fats and ha- increasing your healthy fats. And I still advocate that. So... Um, you definitely should be increasing your total healthy fat intake, um, depending on where you're at currently. But as for carbohydrates, um, I would establish a, a baseline right now of where you're at. So what I would do is not necessarily just ignoring, not ignoring calories, but like basically track, use the app like MyFitnessPal, mm-hmm. track everything and just, just, just track everything without any, making any changes. Yeah. Don't do any mental changes. Cause that way you'll actually get a baseline for where you're at. That's exactly where I'm getting It's yep. I think that's what she should do. So no, that's smart so that she can see, okay, what is she currently <laughs> eating and what, you know, what approximate energy intake level is that at? And what, are, what, are, what does her intake look like that way? If she's maintaining weight, she can look at, okay, now I know where my baseline is for my current homeostatic pattern, Mm -hmm. uh, where I'm maintaining. Now I can make adjustments accordingly. Um, make sure that you're not under eating and under eating is something that I see with a lot of people. Um, and, uh, so that this is where I would say that she should use, uh, one of those basic calculators to at least establish a bare minimum that she should not go under to establish BMR or resting metabolic rate. Yeah, no. And again, like I said, because I'm not going to hack on it, but but uh, I'm not uh, saying she should focus on that. I'm no, just no, no, no. I, I get, I get, as I like get, a uh, a safety measure. No, and I get that. And so, so one of the things about measuring, and, and I'll use calories as an example directly on this. Using calories to to it gives you a number that represents something for a quantity of food. Yeah. So even though you're like I said, I don't believe in calories being a true line for the body. It still gives you an idea how much food you're intaking, so you can still. That's why. That's why certain people can use things like calories as a as a guide um, to uh, to do this kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. So that's what I would do. Just establish mm-hmm. a current baseline for like where she's at, and and then go from there and make adjustments. Now, as for like talking about intuitive eating, what I mean by that is just listening to your body and what it needs. A lot of the time, we just kind of unconsciously eat, and we just kind of food. We just <coughs> eat whatever food is there or what, you know, whatever food, um, you know, mo- most, most of our food these days that's easily accessible is, is carbohydrate based food. Well, especially in the United States. Yeah. So that's where, I mean, that's the majority of what you buy in a grocery store. Yeah. I, I would listen to the body's needs in terms of, I, 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 I'm intuitive with my body and I can tell when I need fats, when I need protein, when I need carbohydrates. And, um, so in terms of a carb recommendation, uh, I would base it off of that. I would say, you know, as long as you're not under eating and as long as you're not overeating based off of approximate measures um, and how your body is feeling and responding. Like if you're if you're in weight maintenance, it doesn't matter what the calorie intake um, uh, or calculations say, you're in neutral energy balance. You are, you know, burning as much as you intake, you're maintaining weight, whatever. Um so well, and again, that can be based on hormones and such too. That's true. There's the the thing the thing with doing intuitive stuff that's a little bit scary is is uh, being people we have this intent this tendency to lean towards uh, things that we want over things that we need, and that's yeah. the only that's the only risk I see in doing something like that. I'm I'm a big believer in, when you're trying to control it like you are. In 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 not doing intuitive stuff, you want to you want to track this stuff pretty dang close, and so planning and programming it that way is going to be smarter for you. Um, but but the the idea of what Taylor's saying is 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 pretty accurate overall. I think that you know when we were talking before about um, when I brought up my concerns about calories, um, one of the things that he brought up at that point was 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 stuff dealing with this kind of idea. Uh, so you actually have an idea where you're going if you, if you know what you're doing. 
being intuitive about it is always going to be smarter ultimately anyway because you, you'll have a feel for it. But when you're when you're trying to do cut the percentages that you are, that's when you start wanting to do uh, tests and trials and stuff on yourself and start playing with pieces of it. Um, carbohydrate car- carbohydrates. Uh, the way that I would recommend um, is I would I would use them more or less as a uh, uh, restoring of energy base for your muscles. Um, because when you take it after your exercise, it's going to cause it to go more into your muscle bellies. And so you'll, uh, you'll have a better effect that way. And you should be able to lose fat on that. Taylor's more of a, uh, a clinical mind than I am on this one, but, uh, um, that's what I would do. And I would try that for a little bit and see how that goes. But if you aren't tracking, getting a baseline, like he says, you'll have no idea if that has any effect whatsoever on what you're doing. Yeah, I would say like let's let's say for example she does that and see it, sees where her carb kind of ratio is like uh, the the total amount of carbs she's taking from taking in from calories uh, and um, you know let's say that's you know fifty percent or something like that. There she has a baseline now that she can right. kind of see. Okay, I'm averaging about half my diet is carbohydrate based. I'm not currently losing weight. Um, but I am I'm already kind of eating very little. So then what I would say at that point is okay, let's let's let's, you know, keep your food intake maybe the same and just increase energy output or activity. Or let's say Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Those no, like, but okay. see I would almost increase food a little bit on that one. Because the thing is is when you when you a lot of times because that's why I bring up hormones in this, a lot of times when you uh when you start to do diet control even if, if you're doing it off the feel or anything, what's going to happen is your body's going to have a hormonal reaction that's going to cause you to stop losing fat. Um, yeah. And that's, and, that's, and, that's, and that's the biggest concern I have in, in, in watching and dropping calories and, and going off that kind of a scale base is that your, your, your potential of having that reaction is going to be higher, that your, your uh, I don't want to use the word physiological, it's true, but that's not what I'm looking for. Um, hormonal base will, uh, will change you know, your reactions, yeah. more food in that case, if it's hormonal will actually cause you to lose weight. Yeah. That actually, I've had that happen with clients where, um, they were eating too little. Right. And, um, increasing their caloric intake actually gave their body kind of a break, gave them enough energy, um, to bring them into a normal range of, right. of right. the deficit. Right. And, Cause like I said, that what it'll do is it'll actually cause your, uh, your hormones more balanced. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of reason why, um, a lot of focus on, uh, more recent diets go towards, uh, blood, um, blood sugar stabilization because they want you to keep you close as they can to a level of blood, blood sugar. So your hormones don't go out of whack. Mm-hmm. But, uh, in, in my, in my view, um, using carbs effectively, um, after working out, you can use them preceding it. But what's going to happen is if you do that, um, you'll burn that out while you're working out because your your uh, type two muscle fibers will eat your your glucose base a lot faster when you're working out, especially if you're doing weight training, resistance training, and so that's why I would say after the fact would probably be more uh, more beneficial in that case because it'll 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 uh, go in and actually. Uh, re-energize the muscles that have, have lost some carbohydrates. It's not like you have to do it right after, but it's the, it's that that's that's how I would personally do it. Yeah, no, that that's a good. So um, I would just see where your carbs are at currently and mm-hmm. make adjustments sure. according based off that. Like you don't necessarily have to switch to a strict ketogenic no. diet no. to lose weight. No, you can no, lose weight sure on on carbohydrate based meal plans still very effectively. Um, but just kind of see what your body needs. See if you're under eating below what we talked about, which is just go go look for a BMR or RMR uh, calculator online and see approximately what it tells you you're at. It's gonna be it's gonna be very approximate. It's gonna be off by hundreds of calories potentially. But if you're eating less than that, that's way too low. So you need right. to bring up the calories from that um, at least a few hundred. And then, um, but but do that after you've tracked an entire week of of your food already in fitness pal without it making any changes that will really tell you where you're at and then you know kind of give you some estimates and measures of, of how you can make some some better um changes and then if you're if you're eating a high 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 carbohydrate meal plan then maybe you bring them down if uh if you're already kind of in a good medium level of carbohydrates um then that's fine it just it kind of depends if you're maintaining right now if you're gaining right now or if you're losing right now um because you uh 
like like Shane was saying, you know, you can gain weight by under eating and having a negative hormone response. So if, you know, that could be the case. If you're eating 1,200 calories a day doing the workout regimen you're doing, you're under eating and you're probably having a negative response hormonally if you're gaining weight. Um, or even if you're maintaining weight, uh, your body's under too much stress and you need to eat more. Um, but let's say you're eating, you, you track your food for a week and you realize you're eating you know, multiple thousands of calories and, and, um, you don't feel stressed and you, uh, you feel satiated with your food and things like that. You, you might be eating a little bit of excess. Uh, So it just kind of depends there. Um, but if you want to, um, pull out some carbohydrates, just make sure if your if your energy intake is, is on the lower end that you replace some of that nutritional value with some healthy fats. So you have enough energy. Well, and the other thing I want to, I want to jump in part of your other, your, uh, second part of your question. Um, or third part, I guess, technically, where, where you're talking about five meals a day. Um, so, so my problem with that is um, the thermic effect that your body gives for meals is lessened when you take small meals throughout the day. So if you have five to six meals a day, it's actually going to ruin the thermic effect, not ruin. It's going to lessen it substantially, though. Why would it lessen it? Because it, it, it spikes with the amount. So, so when, you eat a, when you eat a larger meal, you have a larger thermic effect. No, mm-hmm. you net you net the same it's, proteins, carbs, and fats will not not eat not net the same as each other. But when you intake a certain amount of them, your uh, um, the, uh, the 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 thermic effect of food is when 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 it, you don't net the entire energy value of the food. I'm just explaining this for people. No, I get that. You 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 don't net the entire entire energy value of the food because part of that is lost in the digestive process. Um, but I, I guess you would probably come at it from the same kind of calorie argument of uh, like like if I said you eat one big meal throughout the day versus taking the same amount of calories. When you're, talk, when you're talking energy base, you're right. Okay, so when you but when you're, you're talking thermic, so so what I'm saying is is when you when you have when you have um, your body's reaction to a bigger meal actually causes a bigger thermic effect to your body itself because of how it has to break it down. So it actually causes it to burn it on a hotter level inside your body. That's that, that gives you a boost for that reason. Really? If, so yeah. how, do, do you, how does that function exactly? Oh gosh, man, I'd have to look it up. I don't want to just quote that out in, okay. in this right now. I'll, I'll, I'll do that for something later so we can actually talk about it in depth, but no, I'd be curious to but, learn about that. That would be, but interesting. that's, that's, that's so, so, um, one of the myths, if you will, of, of, uh, training, has been that you need to eat four to, I mean, not four, five to six meals a day to keep from going into to starvation mode. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's been completely blown out of the water by things like intermittent fasting, um, low-carb dieting, keto, ketogenic dieting. And and basically, when, when we talk the calorie base that, again, I don't like, but I don't care. We're just going to talk about this right. So uh, when we talk calorie base... Um, one day's calories does not make or break your your weight loss. Yeah. It's 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 based more on a weekly basis or or longer, and so and it's cumulative. So you you can have it build and 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 decrease and go through all that, but the uh, over the course of a week is going to give you a better accurate measurement on that concept. Yeah, your body doesn't just necessarily work on like this specific twenty four hour twenty four hour clock. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but that being said. Um, they found that that uh, thermically five meals, though it does give a thermic boost, because every time you eat, it raises your 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 uh, thermostat. Um, but bigger meals raise it in a bigger way, so you have a bigger effect. So if you have three smaller meal, I mean uh, three bigger meals instead of six smaller meals, you'll have a bigger effect throughout your day through uh, thermogenesis. That's I just I wanted to kind of yeah, touch see on that, that. See that would be interesting because I have, I haven't heard that. Um... From what I've no- learned, most uh, the meal frequency doesn't have any real uh, effect uh, as much on thermogenesis throughout the day. It's the size than um, than it really just has impacts on uh, like blood sugar. And oh, which like it that. does do that to an extent. Yeah, right. But so it, like I we said, we should have that. We should have another conversation about that. Long term, yeah, yeah. I'm a bigger one. Probably a long one on that one actually. Um, so yeah, you don't have to be doing the whole five or six meals a day thing. I, I used to think that you did because that's what I was taught when I very first started. That's what they teach in training. And, and, and you don't for, have to do that. You, again, it comes back to intuitive eating. Like I, right now I have, uh, I'm actually having breakfast. Uh, I'm having a kind of carbohydrate based breakfast with coffee. I have a high fat snack. 
I have a, a very high protein carbohydrate lunch um, because that I lift and I use that for energy right now for the particular phase I'm in. And then I have a dinner that um, is a little bit lower and um, has like proteins and fats. So I, I mean, I'm what what is that four four times a day? That's just kind of what I'm doing right now. Before that, I was doing intermittent fasting. I wasn't eating. I was only having coffee and water until 12 p.m. and I was eating in an eight-hour window. And guess what? I've I've uh, seen progress, and I've also not seen muscle loss and those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Changing all those different meal frequencies and techniques. So you're 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 fine to experiment. I would just say eat a frequency that's right for you. There's no like specific 100% mathematical equation. I agree with that. Of what you need to totally. do that's going to work specifically for your goal. Just learn your body experiment and see and see what you like see what you respond to try try six meals a day try three meals a day try you know a really small eating window um try low carb try high fat try high high carb low fat like just see kind of what you respond to in your training well it goes back to the people are different exactly um the other part of her question was um what barbell exercises do you recommend um that I, i did want to answer that but uh pretty much do you have? Do you want to? No, you can. You can throw in. I'll. I'll. I'll voice. Well, I'll throw out this fast. I would stay compound. Yeah, which is um, where you're using more than one joint. Yeah. Um, things like squats. Uh, squats are amazingly good for everybody. Um, deadlifts potentially. Uh, bench press. Um, assorted back exercises. Like a bent over barbell row, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the ones that I always go to, um, bigger and bigger we, muscle, big bigger muscle movements. Yeah, we talked about this in um, one of the episodes about foundational exercises. So if you go back and look at that episode, uh, we talk m- more in depth about this concept. But um, the barbells give you a more stable structure to work with, so True you fact. get to lift significantly more percentage of weight than you would with, like, say, the same movement with dumbbells or mach- uh, well, machines will actually allow you to lift. Sometimes more, but they take away the stability aspect, so it's not necessarily as effective. Um, but um, so when you do barbell movements, you want you're looking at doing bigger lifts, like Shane said. So I recommend squats, deadlifts, bench press, barbell rows, bent over rows. Um, you could do they could even hybridize it and do like a T bar row or not? Yeah, like a T bar row. T bars aren't bad. Yeah, um, and. Uh, I feel like I'm missing one. Oh, the overhead press, overhead barbell yeah, press in a sta- press. standing position. Not in a, you can I do mean, seated, but standing will engage things, uh, other things, a little bit better. Without someone helping you, I don't. I wouldn't go into things like uh, uh, not clean and press, but uh, oh, snatch, snatch. I would yeah, do snatch, CrossFit, um, very advanced Olympic lifts. Um, I would be, be wary of those depending yes, on, your, even, uh, even, on your level. Even if you're working with guys. Or people that do CrossFit, the, the, the thing that's scary about Olympic lifts is they, uh, the potential of, of injury goes up dramatically. Mm-hmm. They're and, super technical, absolutely. And and the timeline that it takes to to jump into a CrossFit gym and and start doing them is astronomically small. Yeah, um, guys that are doing it for Olympic type stuff, it takes years for them to actually get it to do it right. But that being said, they are they are better for you overall. Um, and and. You know, I, I I I give kudos to CrossFit for the idea of doing it. I just think there's a the the risk factor is not the implementation worth it. of how they do it is a little, little risky. scary. Yeah, it's a little scary, is what I would use. Um, and it, it kind of sounds like she's more focused on like body composition goal than performance. So I she probably wouldn't go down the CrossFit route. No, as much. and I would I would still you could still use that for for uh, recomping, but yeah, because the honest truth, would, truth is what they do is is actually very good for for that direction, but it's highly risky. Yeah, I would I would work with someone that is um, either a certified strength and conditioning specialist, a CSCS, or someone that is certified specifically for um, Olympic lift. And and I don't consider uh, CrossFit certification no, in that category not because close. it's not. Um, it's way too fast. So they they'll, they'll, they'll say that it's an Olympic lifting cert, but it's it's so <laughs> we don't have to talk about it. But well, it's, it's well, not well, credible. I, I don't want to step away from this at all. Actually, I want to talk about it for two seconds. So the the uh, one thing I want to cover before we move off off of it is. Um, they, their, their certification is too fast for it to be an actual Olympic lifting oh, certification. Yeah. It takes I, a I'm, weekend for a CrossFit which trainer is, to get which certified. Which is ridiculous when you're talking about the lifts that they're talking about. Cause those lifts, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get hurt doing them. Absolutely. So that's, that's the only thing I want to touch and then we'll move on to the next stuff. So hopefully that answers. Next one is from Meg and she 
a little bit longer. There's a lot of uh, aspects to this, but she says, um, I've been uh, following a ketogenic diet for almost a year now. That's discipline. Um, I've dipped out from time to time due to traveling and life obviously happening. I'm athletic. I work out five, four to five times a week. I walk three to five miles uh, if I don't work out. I do a lot of high-intensity interval training. Uh, she says moderately for 45 minutes. Um, heavy weightlifting. The number on the scale is going up. I don't know if it's an indicator of progress. She doesn't feel like it's muscle. She feels like it's body fat. My clothing is getting tighter. Um, I track uh, my food and I'm uh, consuming enough calories to either lose or maintain. And she says, what's going on? I Am I overtraining? Um, am I stressing myself out? And uh, is there anything else in there? Am I consuming too much protein to keep me in a ketogenic state? Uh, I'm often hungry, and um, my net carb intake is always below about 30. I assume she means 30% um, with a lot of fiber. So basically, you know, what I when I was reading this, the, the biggest indicator that I saw here was um, – uh, over training for intake four to five. So you're training four to five times a week doing heavy lifting. If you're not doing that, you're definitely getting in, um, over almost 10,000 well, steps, probably over 10,000 steps. But that's depending. an assumption. So, so here's the thing. So if you're doing four to five times a week and you're not, and you're not doing a, uh, what they call a bro split, then you're over, you're probably over training if you're doing heavy all the time. Okay, if you're doing, I would say it even depends on volume because even it if does, she's doing it does a, depend on it d- does depend on volume. But if she's doing a back, chest, uh, shoulders, legs, yeah. arms, she wouldn't be necessarily overtraining it four to five times a week. That being said, I don't think it's optimal. Okay, uh, and 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 again, we're we're taking assumptions because we don't know that for a fact. Um, hit, uh, you want to do hit training. Probably under twenty minutes. Yeah, that was. Um, that's that's a little excessive to do it anything above that. So if you're doing, it says that you're doing moderate cardio for forty five minutes, so that you kind of have that separated. You so don't, that, that's what I would want to clarify: is is she doing high intensity interval training truly, or is she doing moderate cardio? Because high intensity interval training is high intensity. Moderate would be more of a. Uh, or she could be doing a hit that is kind of like not that intense, no, but it's kind of intervally. That's not really hit though. So and yeah. you're, you're right in what you're saying. So the thing, the thing with hit though is, is, is you want to do spiked high activity where you're like, like if you're on all a, out. Yeah, if you're on a on a uh, bike or a treadmill, you're sprinting on a treadmill, or you're, you're you're literally pedaling as fast as you possibly can for like thirty seconds to a minute, and then you almost stop. No, not quite. Stop. I didn't. She, say, I said almost. So yeah, you slow. But, you slow down to a crawl. So the idea is you go from a full out sprint to very then, low then you, intensity. Then you go down to like walking at one mile an hour. I mean, it's it's crazy different. Yeah. And and it's uh, that that's a little. That's why he was asking that about moderate. Because if you're doing moderate cardio, then you're probably not doing true hit. And if you're doing if you're doing high intensity too moderate, that's too much too. Yeah, and I, I mean, yeah, forty-five minutes for hit training is is, is like three workouts yep. put into one. You want to sp- I would cut that up into three fifteen-minute hit sessions um, because that's just too much. So where she's saying, okay, on a, on a on a th- um, thermogenesis calorie, you know, level, if she's if she's estimating her intake at maintenance or lower based off calculations, she's under eating. Regardless of, of whether that no, those numbers are accurate, or not, because her weight is going up and Likely. she's eating in a controlled, restricted caloric Agre- intake. Agreed. And if, if she's feeling like the uh, like her clothes are getting tighter, that could be an indicator of of muscle development, depending on how lean she is. But but That's true. but but usually people see inches decrease even when their weight is going up with muscle development. So I would I would say that's an indicator that well, it probably is fat gain. And I mean, agreed, agreed. It depends again. It depends on where where the clothes are getting tied on her too. True. So so if it's getting tied around your waist or your hips, the odds are, depending on how many much you're squatting, uh, but your waist it will actually almost always be a good representation of um, fat, fat gain. gain. Yeah. So so you're you're probably right that you are gaining fat, is my guess. Yeah. It just it just looks to me that it's. It's um, it's probably stress related. Too much training for food intake. It's not too much training overall. It's just you need to increase that food intake based, based on our assumptions. Because yeah, based like on I said, these we, assumptions. We uh, we don't have enough. Even though you gave us a pretty lengthy 
description on this. We uh, The big indicators here for me, especially, that she was under eating was I'm hungry often and she said she's very sore um, most of the time. So so I think that I think that the the the, the either the volume uh, or or the frequency and the intensity or all three combined of your workouts is too stressful on the body for the amount of energy intake and if you're hungry often I mean being hungry is okay but being hungry often or all the time is probably an indicator of under eating you're trying to perform like an athlete potentially depending on how your workouts are structured which I think is great. So you need to fuel like an athlete. There's you can still burn fat doing that. You Don't be afraid to increase your food intake. Just try it for two weeks. Wherever you're at, bring yourself up. So Buy a few hundred calories consistently each day for 7 well, to 14 days. See how you respond. But here's, here's what I'm going to tell you too. So um, based on everything you've written in here, you're eating too much protein. I'm guessing that. But I'm, I'm not. Oh, my, you're right. Yes. My guess there is that some... you are eating too much protein because you're looking for for ketosis. Um, ketosis is based on fats. People believe it's based on proteins. Proteins, like I said before, is a is a building block that'll help with your your muscles themselves to re uh, restructure themselves. But when you're trying to burn fat cells you're, and you want to go into a ketogenic state, you you're going to have higher fats because your body actually will trans, transfer into that. So you're probably eating too much protein. Not that I think that that's causing you to be fatter. It, um, it may, it, well, but it, no, not if she's eating. It's in not like yeah. it's not likely to be. But that being said, hormonally it could be. Yeah. So because pro, uh, proteins, as we've talked about before, can convert into a into a uh, substitute for glucose. Yeah. But um, that's that's where I would start to to question is I would probably raise my fat levels. Um, you're uh, from what I can read, you're doing really well on um, on carbs for being ketogenic. Yeah. Well, and I mean, honestly, like, like you said, you know, should I, should I consider continuing, um, ketogenic or is this plan just not for me? Um, it, it might not be for you. It like, may not be for honestly, you. Honestly, like, I did keto, I did keto with, um, some refeeds periodically, um, for the last up and uh, up until a couple weeks ago for like three months. And I saw some initial, I, all the benefits I saw from keto were in the first 30 days. Everything after that, I, it's either plateaued or it started to go off. It stabilizes and much. and it just wasn't for me. I I I like some certain carb foods. Carbs aren't a bad thing. It's just about how you how you live your life mm-hmm. in in appropriate balance with food and exercise and, and things like that and habits and whatnot. And and I'm just a person that likes carbs. So I decided to ramp my carbs back up. And I've noticed good things and I've noticed different changes that have taken place as I've done that. So don't feel like you have to do this ketogenic diet if yeah. if it's like. If it's uh, or permanently, if if it's causing all these problems or stressors and things like that, or or you're just not seeing the results, it might not be what's going to help you see those results. See, and I'm going to tell you, it's probably a combination between some things you're doing. The, well, there's a lot of factors. in Yeah, this there's situation. a lot of factors in this. The, the downside is, is since we we aren't close enough to be able to 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 see it more um, in the real light, it makes it harder to answer this question. But. Um, you know, like I said, you're with what you're with, with the way way that you worded it. I think you're going to be higher on proteins than yeah. you are on fats. You need your fats high, and your and your your proteins I, about uh, are about thirty percent of your your intake, or maybe a little less. Yeah, twenty five. I, I would even say that, um, like I said, you know, you need to probably experiment with increasing your total intake from where you're currently at. Don't just change the ratios, but actually increase the total amount of food you're consuming. Mm-hmm. Doing that from fats, if you're going to stay ketogenic. Like if, if you want to still try this ketogenic thing, the fat in- needs to be up because you're you're too hungry and you're too underfueled an energy thing. for how much you're training. And so keto will not be as effective for you and you'll feel not good. You'll feel groggy or irritable and things like that or fatigued if you're under fueling on energy in general right and so i would say if, if she's going to stay that. in that state then the, the energy's got to come up for sure from fats oh for sure but where you said i'm consuming am i consuming too much protein to keep me in a ketogenic state um that's not necessarily even if she was high protein it wouldn't take her out of ketosis because no, it, it protein wouldn't. is used as a just... um building block for the structure of, of different structures of your body Correct. especially muscle tissue um and Having excess of it isn't going to take you out of ketosis necessarily. Sure. It's just going to pot- – protein excess would store as fat. Um, it would but, go in as fat. That's but, right. But um, 
your... But that that does fit with what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, she might be she she might be uh, in uh, if if her intake is too low, she might be in a gluconeogenesis state where you're where she's burning protein for energy because well, her intake might be that's too that's low. That's exactly what I'm saying because based on her questioning, proteins to keep her in a ketogenic state implies that she's eating a lot of protein. Mm-hmm. If you, like I said, the only the only problem with that is is you want to have higher fat levels because that's where you're going to get your energy energy base from. That's where your uh, uh, well, that's where ketogenic stuff comes from is fats. Yeah. So I would the, the problem you've got is is you've got so much going on looking at this that we've got to start to isolate. Yeah. And, and the Take only it way, one factor at a right. Time. And so what I would do, how I would start off is I would change it and, and make sure your your fat intake is high enough because you want to have sixty to seventy percent fats in your in your consumption when you're going ketogenic. Um, try that for a week, maybe two weeks. If you don't see any improvement and within two weeks, I would start to, to re uh, uh, move in carbs. Yeah, I wouldn't carb load because oh, yeah. that's going to be a bad effect. Mess you up <laughs> absolutely. And then I would, but I would slide into it slowly and play with carbs, and 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 then I, because that way you can isolate to an extent how your food intake is doing and in, in, in your hunger issues. Mm-hmm. Um, at which point I would start to look at your training. So so you want to start to isolate these piece by piece so you can actually narrow in on, on what's causing what in, in your reaction. Because like I said, everybody's individual in how, how training is. Everybody's individual in how uh, dieting is. Um, it, it really comes down to how it, it reacts in your own physiology. And, and uh, without being very specific in what you're doing, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to figure that out. So you're going to have to play with this a little bit. I think it really just comes down to looking at all these factors that there's, there is too much, too many stresses or stressors or too much of a stress. And that's why she's well, probably I, responding sure this way. So you, yeah, most of this. yeah, you got to look at training stress, nutrition stress, and think about this too, recovery. Are you sleeping enough? That's true. Too. Are you getting enough recovery in between workouts? Yep. The soreness implies that might not be the case. It, 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 you could be fine. It depends on really the, the the level of perceived soreness and things like that. But so those are some ideas for you to start with um, on that. Keep us keep us in the loop on this though. I, yeah. I'm, I'm really I'd like to be actively involved in that. Yeah, give us a follow up next week or the week after once you make a change and and uh, we'll we'll talk. Um, now Sue is asking for the average person, how do you know when to go into a ketogenic diet? Are there specific markers that indicate if you're ready? Would specific body types respond better than others? Um, there's not necessarily, you don't necessarily, you don't hit like this milestone where it's like, okay, now I can go keto. It's just, it's, it's a type of dieting technique that can be utilized, um, for certain, for certain effects or, um, uh, a certain outcome if, you know, and, and not, and certain people shouldn't do it based off their goals, based off, you know, um, uh, it just depends on the individual person. Um, what's interesting to me was the part about body type specific because um, you don't think so? No. What about what about uh, hormonal all based. of John Berardi's research? Uh, hormonal based stuff. So so body types. That's what his stuff is based on. Well, I know I get that, but what I'm saying is body typing is 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 different necessarily than than hormonal based because you can have. You have a similar hormone base. Oh, are you talking about body typing from a genetic standpoint? Yeah, yeah and that's what I'm okay. assuming that is, is what her question's saying. Okay. And I would well, let's say, talk about both because I, that's they, totally they do fine. determine body types. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. So I And I'm going to tell you that hormones are definitely actively involved to make an ectomorph an ectomorph. Yeah. yeah. So there's no question about that. So And, and, and again, don't, don't get me wrong on this. We haven't talked about this in depth, but ectomorphs, um, the whole bi- basis behind uh, somatotyping is it was based on psychology. It was created by a psychologist back in 1940, I believe. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But he uh, he did it based on the idea that big, heavy people were happy. Okay? And, and that is... Really? Yeah. That's where it I all... See, I don't know this That's That's where it all stemmed from. Happy it's people... It's that young? Yeah, somatotyping is. Yep, oh. yep. So it, it it started out with the idea that that's what it was about. So okay. The hormonal type. You're talking not, about hormones. not hormones yet. I'm talking about where body typing comes from. So so I'm giving a basic okay. overview. I'm not going to go into depth in this because there's a lot to it. But um, the idea that that heavy people were happier and light people were not. That's what the the whole psychology behind it, which has been completely proven to be false. That being said, it is still a tool that you can use based on how bodies react that are lighter to heavier. And so so using it as a base body type for for a physical aspect, 
I'm not saying it's a perfect science, but I'm going to tell you that, that it is a good tool to actually be able to stem setting a, a, a not necessarily a meal plan, but, but food to an extent, as well as a, um, exercise program. But when you're talking something like ketogenic stuff, you're talking more hormonally based stuff. And that would be outside of a physical nature. And that's the reason why I question uh, if body types would actually be involved in that for only for that reason. Um, hormonal issues, which are more internal, absolutely. It would be an indicator on that, but being able to see that until you try it is going to be a lot harder to do. Yeah. So, well, what was interesting to me is I was thinking about it. So John Berardi is who uh, he's a biochemist. Yeah. He's extremely intelligent. He's a very intelligent guy. And he's, um, who I have a lot of my nutrition education through. Um, and, uh, He's a very good he, he bases too. his nutrition off of body type concepts, but in what Shane's referring to is not necessarily genetic factors that I that I'm aware of in, in his in his programs, but um, the more of the hormonal profiles that certain body types possess. Mm-hmm. So it, on a basic level, that you have an ectomorph, which is a naturally thin, uh, thinner structure, can be taller. They can still be small, but they, they're typically thinner structured. Um, mesomorphic, naturally muscular. Um, and endomorphic, which is naturally heavy, it tends to retain a lot more body fat, can still have a lot of muscle too. Um, and in from his his teachings, essentially on, on a on a basic level, ectomorphs respond really well in terms of fat loss and muscle development from high carbohydrate diets up to 50, up to sixty percent um, with uh, lower fats and medium protein. Mesomorphs are in the middle with kind of a medium uh, protein around, or I'm sorry, a medium carb intake of about 40% and moderate protein and fat at 30%. And then endomorphs respond really well to high fat um, due to things like insulin sensitivity and um, other things. Um, and they typically are on 40% or higher fat intake and very low carbohydrates and medium proteins around 30, 35, I think. So that's kind of what his philosophy is based off of body type. So how that would tie into here is that based off that approach, uh, what John Berardi teaches would say that a heavier body type would respond better to ketogenic than, say, an ectomorph, so endomorph versus ecto. Well, we're, I want to talk about this in, a, in an episode. We may do this. Taylor and I haven't really decided what we're going to do in the next one, but I kind of want to throw this out there soon. So yeah, we, we do need to do, do body, body type body stuff. Thing. So I, I think I think I don't want to touch this in, in very d- heavy depth yet because okay. I, I want to I want to not that we're going to come back to this question, but I, I want to. Uh, do body type stuff um, in more detail, and hopefully we'll do that like soon, soon. Cool. So that gives you some information about that. Um, Brie Linda, what do you do when you've messed up your metabolism from not eating enough and you gain weight no matter what? Am I going first? I think you're going first because <laughs> I'm going to have to think on it a little bit. Okay, so what do you do when you've messed up your metabolism from not eating enough and you gain weight no matter what? This kind of is related to um, – it's a hormonal base. The, the previous one of the previous questions yep. um, about really just this messing up the metabolism. We have an episode that's going to air about metabolic damage soon, um, and it'll it's related to this. But metabolic damage is when you've done something, you've put too much stress on your metabolism on your body to where your metabolism shuts down from various factors, whether it's training or nutrition or both, and lack of sleep, those kind of things. And so when you've messed up your metabolism, that's what you're talking about is metabolic damage. Um, and so no matter what you do, you're gaining weight. That means you could be eating less and you gain weight. You eat more, you gain weight. You you train less, you train more, you gain weight. What's happening is your body's in this um, damaged, uh, st- high stress state where all it wants to do is survive and there's too many stress factors. So like I said, think about physical training, sleep or recovery, and nutrition intake. Those are your primary factors that are going to impact that. There could also be other like psychological factors that's, of stress that can actually impact this. Yeah, stre- stress, stress, uh, your, body, your body reacts to stress the exact same no matter where it's yeah. coming from. It's psychological, it's physical, it doesn't matter. It can be, it can be the weather changing. It will actually change. We could talk about that in depth when you start talking the neurological system, but yeah. So, I mean, pretty much... Uh, if you're gaining weight no matter what, you're under too much stress of some kind. So I isolate it. Look at your training. Are you training too much, too frequently, too intensely, uh, uh, not uh, uh, too 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 much volume? That those kind of things. Assess those and get that to a, a maintainable level. Your goal when you're coming out of a metabolically damaged state potentially is to just stabilize. It doesn't matter if you go up in weight or go down weight. You're just looking to get better. 
meaning you're having a normal functioning metabolism. So don't look at the scale. Uh, don't don't base. You're not you're not going for like your ultimate goal here. This is a different goal of repairing. And well, and let, let me add this really fast in this because I want to go up based off kind of spring off what you're saying. So here here's what I'm going to tell you, Bree. Instead of worrying about weight, worrying about health. Okay. And how you feel. And how you feel. So if if you go into the gym and you come out of it dying, you did the wrong thing. Okay. Go into the gym, play with weights, stay away from the cardio for a while, play with weights exclusively, okay, and and don't worry about your weight. And we say that because resistance training will actually increase metabolism while aerobic training depending on what you do can actually repress metabolism well ultimately it will it's long term yeah so that's where we say and and when we say wait if you're in a metabolically damaged state you should be doing very low intensity this should be set rest protocol you do a set you don't go to failure you take a break yep. you, you know then you get back to it when you feel ready for it you shouldn't be very aerobic your heart rate shouldn't be up you shouldn't do tons of volume but you should hit do full bodies you know well, let's, a let's, few times a week we'll give you a really brief Full body, I would do something like squats. I would do something like um, look up stiff day, stiff leg deadlifts or Romanian deadlifts. Um, I would do. Uh, I would probably go in and do something like if you can do pull ups, I'd do pull ups probably. Um, I would probably then do something like a bench press. Um, I would do some basic shoulder stuff, maybe in side side lateral raises. Might what I would probably throw out there. Uh, do some kind of bicep curl. Um, you know, alternating dumbbells, dumbbell curls, barbell curls. Um, and then I would probably do like a tricep push down if you have cable, a cable machine where you can use it. Um, and then I would, and at that point I would do calves if you want to do it. I wouldn't be worried about it. I'd only be going in to do a few sets, maybe two sets per, per body part. And I would do eight to 12 and I wouldn't push it to, to extremes. I would just get it, get the movement down. I wouldn't be trying to do a weight that's even hard at 12. I would go to 8 to 12. 12 would be my top. And I would do it so that I had complete control no matter what I did. I would do full movement. So in squats, I would go down to at least 90 degrees. I would do a hair below 90 degrees to start with um, so you don't hurt your knees because I don't want you bouncing. Um, and then, um, not that you can't, but you just have to do that one very controlled. But but that's what I would do, Bree. And then I would I would kind of go forward from there. And, and, and then I would eat, I would eat enough that I have enough energy that I'm not feeling like I'm, I'm hungry all the time. Yeah. And I wouldn't worry about anything else at this point. That almost comes back again to the intuitive eating thing. Like, yes, absolutely. At this point for sure. Eat, eat for health, not for fat loss. Eat, eat to feel energized, to feel good and satiated, but not to excess. I, I mean, if you, if you know you're, you're, this question is based off the fact that you said you're, you're, you kind of know you're under eating. If you know that already, then you know you're under eating. I would increase the food, the, the food intake. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you could use one of those calculators to find what a, not, not your, your resting metabolic rate, but I would even do like a total daily energy expenditure calculator to see what that estimate is. And I would even, I would go see, towards and, that or and, above. And I hate to say it. I wouldn't even do that at all. I would, I would completely eat for for satiation so so what that means is that you're not hungry one but see one thing that's an issue though when it comes down to this is people's metabolisms adapt to where they're at so that's true. i get people that come to me that eat that. 900 calories a day and they're like no i'm fine i'm functioning fine but usually that's psychological they block that that's what head. i'm saying though and they and sometimes and can't get true. out of their head i'll give to you see that, that i'll need. give you that so he has a point on that one so that's where that's where I I do like the, some of those metrics because I have had a lot of people come to me where they're eating but somewhere between nine hundred and twelve hundred calories a day because I've had them track that it for a week. Crazy, and they're like, no, I go to work, I I still get you know um, you know an adequate amount of sleep, and sometimes they don't, and they do seem like positive people. They don't seem super irritable, and they're like, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry, and I say that's because you have repressed your metabolism to match your intake, and you do have Which to start to true. kind of ramp it up. No, Taylor's got a really good point on this. So that's the only reason that I would say that, you know, recommending increase of, of intake as well as potentially a, 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 um, give her a slight bit, a little bit of a surplus so that so that you her, want a surplus for sure. So that her that body comes saying. out of that emergency yes, state. Yes. Because see, what's happening is when you go into metabolic damage, your body goes into survival mode. OK, and that's that's the problem here is that that when you're in survival mode, you're not going to do anything but gain fat. I mean, it's not it's not survival mode does not do well for muscle building. No. So you want to you want to break that and 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 without question, stress stress is the biggest 
creator, if you will, for survival mode, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and just know, too, this is not necessarily going to be a short repair. Like, depending on how long this has It'll lasted, take a while. it could be weeks to months of you doing... Uh, you know, a normal low stress resistance training regimen multiple times a week and having a normal balanced or slight surplus food intake for multiple weeks or months and just eat and fe- starting to feel better and getting adequate sleep, you know, whatever that is for you. But usually that's kind of bet- most people between between six and nine hours, depending on the person. Um, and I, just make your goal no, nothing to do with body composition and everything to do with feeling awesome. Well, feeling awesome. Here's but here's some other goals, okay? Because I'm going to give you a little bit beyond what he just said. So so we're going to add in a little bit of stress as you're doing this because this is kind of a crucial thing when you're when you're trying to build your body into the right direction. So, but you, like I said, I don't want you to overdo it. But if you can gain a little bit of weight as you move forward you want to do that when you're working out so like so weight or fat weight i'm talking pushing weight so so like if you're squatting we're gonna go oh oh low, the weight gonna, she's lifting yes. in the workout okay, right yeah. we're gonna go low weight so so let's say you're squatting 20 pounds or 10 pounds i don't even care what it is you start off with 10 pounds it's not gonna be hard for you at all you're gonna be able to do it without a problem you know you go through the movement i want to make sure that's that's crucial in this you go through the movement you do it eight times to twelve times. If you're if you're starting to feel like you're going too heavy, then you stay at eight and you play with that until you can feel like you can move to nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So, but you want to progressively move forward. Yeah, which is a concept of, called progressive resistance or yep. progressive overload, where right. each week or well, it doesn't have to be a specific time frame, but I'm not. I don't uh, care about time over frame. over time. You're increasing the, the the resistance level that you're doing so that you're stimulating metabolism and, and muscle development, and that will make you move faster through. Absolutely, because it because if she just sticks with the same weight all the time, same reps, it won't do anything just, for you. She'll just stay in the same state that she's yep. in. If anything, you'll that's backwards. a really good point. So so that just just include that in your what you're doing, and then uh, and then we'll go from there. So until next, you send me messages, my friend. <laughs> okay. Everybody, that was our Q and A's for uh, today. So, if you do have more Q and A's um, or other people that are listening, because we know there's there's a lot of you out there. We see the numbers. There's a lot of you out there that aren't asking questions, and we'd love to hear from you. So, email us at Taylor at MetabolicRadio.com or Shane at MetabolicRadio.com, um, or just look for uh, go to Metabolic Radio and click on the Q and A tab, and we'll answer your questions next week. That works. Thanks, guys. Peace. See you later. Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. Shane and I hope you learned something new and exciting today about your own health and fitness. Head over to MetabolicRadio.com. There you'll find our bios and our results-driven programs that are designed to help teach you everything you need to know when it comes to getting real permanent results. You can also sign up for our newsletter to get free weekly updates. To chat with Shane or I, just email us at Taylor at MetabolicRadio.com or Shane at MetabolicRadio.com. We would love to hear from you. You can also join the conversation on Facebook. Just go to Facebook.com and search for Metabolic Radio Private Forum. There you can request to join the group. We would love to add you to the conversation and answer your questions on the show. And hey, if you like our podcast, please help us grow our community by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. We would really appreciate your help. Thanks again so much for all your support and your listenership. Now go out there and spread the good word of fitness.